I'm uh, Joe Z, and I'll be giving a talk on moving big iron, which for the purposes of this presentation, I'm considering to be a system that consists of more than just a few racks or cabinets. So um, before we get started, uh, some of you already know me, but for those who don't, here's a little background on myself. I'm an electrical engineer by profession and a collector of vintage electronics. Uh, with kind of a focus on computer, network, and telephony equipment. Um, in the past few years, I've participated in the removal of central office telephone switches uh, on two occasions. First time was a Northern Telecom SL100 from the University of Alabama, and the uh, second time was an AT&T 5 ESS from an undisclosed uh, independent telco. So the SL100 now resides in my garage, and the 5 ESS is in the hands of another collector. Um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on moving heavy things, but I've got some decent experience. Um, real quick, real quick, the uh, top picture there is a 5 ESS, or the top of one anyway, and the bottom picture is uh, part of the, the SL100. <clears throat> So before we get started, uh, here's your only warning. Don't, don't do it. Don't buy a thing that takes up an entire building on its own. The cost of such an endeavor only starts with the purchase price. Uh, there's usually an order of magnitude more in the removal effort, uh, transportation, storage, power, etc. Speaking of storage, you need space for this stuff. Uh, if you don't have it, that's obviously an additional cost. Also takes quite a bit of time, you know, especially as the system scales larger, uh, can become a significant amount of effort in moving the things, setting it up, etc. cetera. So um, all that is bound to stress you out and have you questioning your sanity at the end of it. Uh, anyway, we'll assume you're like me and none of that dissuaded you and just move on. Um, my opinion, the key to success on any such thing is generally to get as much plan in advance as you possibly can, particularly where you're limited, uh, on time and you don't want to have to make like multiple trips across the country to get this thing done. So <laughs> there's a lot of details to consider, but generally you need help. Uh, transportation for you and your help in the stuff, uh, lodging, storage, tools, and equipment for decabling and deinstalling, removal, moving, uh, depending on which parts of that you have to manage yourself. Uh, and you need to have a rough idea of schedule too. So the more detailed the schedule you make, that can kind of help if you're very time constrained and you need to make sure things happen at a certain time. But on the other hand, if you haven't done this before and you don't have a good metric, then a detailed schedule is kind of useless because it's false precision. Um, in some cases, there could be uh, additional special requirements that could vary case to case. Um, in my case, the university wanted me to have liability insurance in case I like knocked over the SL100 and took the building down around it or something. Um, I was able to find an online insurance company that specialized in like contractor type insurance uh, for short term jobs. Uh, basically got an insurance policy for the five days that we were actually removing the switch without having to get like, you know, six month business policy or something. Um, so to undertake a project like this, you're going to need to find some people who are willing to help you. Um, and failing that, you may have to pay some people to help you. The right number of people is very dependent on what exactly the situation is, but generally too few people and you're going to have trouble getting things moved on time or uh, being able to move the heavier items and then uh, too many people and you just start tripping over each other. So there's kind of a balance there. Um, as a couple points of reference, the uh, SL100 move had four people for probably about five 12 hour days. Um, we managed to remove 15 cabinets plus anything that wasn't bolted down by the time we left. And the 5 ESS move had uh, six people. 
at peak, but it kind of averaged out to maybe four or five people over uh, six, 10 hour days. And they hired movers to actually load the truck once everything was deinstalled. So um, in that case, we removed 17 cabinets plus all the main distributing frame cabling and wire wrap blocks. So lots of uh, cabling and cable connecting stuff. Um, the SL100 move ended up happening in two parts. Uh, the first part, we moved a lot of equipment into local storage because basically we had no way to get the heavier parts into the one-way truck. I'll get into that a little more later. Uh, the second part involved planning in advance how to accomplish moving those heavy things into the truck uh, and then going back down there to load everything into the truck on that second trip. Um, in both cases, the people who were helping me were people I knew through the vintage computing or telephone communities. Uh, several of them are sitting in this room. Um, and uh, specifically people I know from IRC or this show, a few other places. So both times uh, I had a group of four people, including myself. And for the five ESS, I wasn't really involved with finding all the people who helped with that. Uh, but I suspect it was a similar thing. People from the telephone community who were known by the guy who got the switch and, uh, yeah, consisted of a number of people who traveled from around the country with varying degrees of assistance and getting out there, um, who had uh, varying levels of experience moving equipment like that. Some people who'd done it multiple times in their lifetime and other people who were fresh out of, uh, fresh into that sort of thing. So think uh, over the several days, we had seven different people involved in that. As far as uh, coming up with kind of a schedule, there's a few major considerations. Something to note is that very often for these sorts of things, there can be a deadline for removing the equipment. Um, you need to work with whoever's in possession of the equipment currently to make sure that you know what their timeline needs to be so you can plan yours. Um, sometimes it's reasonable, sometimes it's not, and you may have to try and work with them to come up with something that is reasonable. Um, very often these sorts of things could be things needed to be gone yesterday and now they're there and if you don't come get them, then the scrappers will um, to, you know, be shredded or whatever. Um, Sometimes in better situations, it's a lot more flexible. The things are sitting around. If they come out sometime in the next few months, that'd be great. You want to use the space for something else. That was, that was the SL yeah, that was kind of the case for uh, the SL100. So they did um, originally had kind of a ridiculous time frame on the thing, but in talking to them, they were like, yeah, anytime before the end of the summer, because then you'll be in the way of normal being a university, you'd be in the way of the normal uh, school year. So, But whatever the deadline for the removal actually is, you'll want to find a time that you and the people helping you uh, have availability. So you have to kind of work with all of them, figure out what time, what date works. And uh, obviously that requires some planning on their part when they're taking off work or whatever else is going on, planning a trip, et cetera. So, um, of course, a big part of that is estimating how long the actual removal process will take. So there's a lot of variables there. Uh, in a telephone office, the cable is very dense. There's hundreds of pounds of it above the frames and cable racking. And it's usually laced in place with wax twine or cable ties. And so there's a lot of work just to get that stuff out. And um, Cabinets and telephone offices also tend to be bolted to the adjacent cabinets to make the whole thing very rigid, which means you've got extra bolts to take out. Um, whereas a number of computers uh, oftentimes are just racks on wheels, even in the best case. Um, so, uh, well, they're also bolted to the ground. Yeah, and of course, the racks are bolted to the ground. So, um, don't have much experience with the computer side of heavy equipment at this scale, but you know, cable density may vary. Telephone offices are very dense. You have thousands of wire pairs coming out of frames and that sort of thing, but computers may be a little less dense. Um, another thing to consider is that 
if you don't remove things by the deadline, there could be penalties. Uh, in my case, we did not have time to remove the entire SL100 that consisted of 47 equipment frames, which you see in the top picture there. Um, and uh, technically, this constituted failure to pick up the item I had purchased at auction, and I cannot any longer buy anything at auction from the University of Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the good news is that I still do did get a working system out of it. So uh, as a point of reference, though, on timing, the SL100 and 5ESS removals both took around, I estimated, about 16 person hours per cabinet of equipment. Um, admittedly, that sounded a bit high when I initially estimated it, but that does count all of the decabling, unbolting, disassembly down to the cabinet level and moving. So well, and also doing things like getting going to the hardware store and getting yeah unplanned things in, you know. um admittedly it counts yeah packing up some loose stuff too in both cases there were a lot of spare parts tapes documentation stuff in cabinets and on shelves um and there's a learning curve once you do the first few cabinets you kind of know how to do it so you can get things done a lot faster on the next one uh so it's not really totally linear but as a number, you know, I'd probably budget like 18 to 20 person hours per cabinet if you want a really clean D install with fewer cut cables and you're going to do all the moving yourself. If you're not moving it yourself, it'll go faster. Like if you're hiring movers or if you're just going to chop all the cables and figure it out later, then you can shave a little time off there. Um, if you need to document where all the cabling goes, that can add a bunch of time too. Uh, for the first part of the SL100 removal, I planned for a whole week, two days for driving there and back, five days for working on the actual removal. Um, and then for the second part, we just needed to move everything out of storage and load it into the truck. So I planned a couple days to drive down um, along with uh, one of the people who was helping me. And then we'd meet the other two people down there and kind of start on it that night. Um, and then the next morning we'd work through the whole day getting everything loaded and if needed we could take some time on the next day um, although we ended up not needing it and then we'd be on our way back home for the 5 ESS a couple people arrived earlier than everyone else to sort of assess the situation um, I think that was on Tuesday earlier in the week and then they did uh, some preparation work then to starting some of the power decabling and uh, most of the rest of everyone got there kind of that night and we were all started on it the next morning. Um, spent the rest of the week working on just getting all the cabling done on the switch and started unbolting things and then uh, worked, including Saturday, basically got to a point where we said this stuff is ready to move. Took Sunday off and then got there on Monday and did the rest of the finishing tasks before the movers arrived. Um, the original plan in that case was to go all the way to Wednesday, but the working days were limited, were supposed to be limited to eight hours, but the telephone company that we were at actually ended up, um, having one of the employees stay behind and ma they made some overtime out of that and, and also on the Saturday. So, and because that kind of went from eight hour days to 10 hour days and we got Saturday, we were done early. So once you have a general schedule worked out, you've got to figure out how everyone is actually going to get there. So depending on how far you have to go, you can kind of weigh your options between driving there, air travel, uh, various other options. But driving comes with the obvious advantage that you can bring a lot of tools and equipment, which is, could be pretty vital. Um, for that reason, I've always driven because I pack up my car with as much tools many tools as I think I might need and usually I need all of them um, that, that car was but um, if you have another way to get tools on site uh, you could opt to travel another way and uh, save some time there it's also worth considering renting a car especially if you have to like pick up a truck and then drive it back and then you can get a one-way car rental and not have to have somebody drive your car back um, Speaking of uh, trucks, generally the more economical option is 
uh, to rent a truck rather than buy one, unless you're going to be doing this sort of thing a lot or you have access to a truck through some other means. Um, and just a tip, rental rates for one-way way rentals are often highly dependent on uh, where you pick them up and drop them off. So both times I ended up renting the truck uh, in Nashville because it turned out significantly cheaper. So if you look at the route on the slide here, I started around here in Chicago, drove south, passed through Nashville on the way to Tuscaloosa. I checked rental rates in Tuscaloosa. Um, Turned out they were cheaper in Birmingham. And then I was like, well, I'll check Nashville. And then it was like substantially cheaper in Nashville yet again, even counting the cost of diesel. Uh, so I ended up doing that um, and uh, saved some money that way. It just means I had to drive the truck from Nashville to Tuscaloosa, but I had enough people that wasn't really a concern. Um, so when you're choosing your cargo transportation, it is also very important to consider the loading conditions at both ends. So if you have loading docks available, uh, highly recommend that you use them. Makes things a lot easier. In that case, you want to make sure that you get a truck that matches the height of the dock, or maybe you'll need some dock ramps or things if it's a smaller truck. Um, as a general rule, box trucks in kind of the 20 foot plus range are going to be your standard dock height, very similar or close to a, like a semi-trailer. Um, in the case of the SL100, we did not have a loading dock. And without a loading dock, the first thing I considered was to get a truck with a lift gate, but I kind of ran into a snag there. Turns out that you can't generally get one way rentals with a lift gate. Um, that's just not a standard feature in the one-way fleet of your typical truck rental company. You can rent a uh, so-called local rental truck, but then you have to start wherever you're at, rent the truck, drive all the way there, and then load everything and drive all the way back, which can increase the cost. But to, at some point... Usually can't be out of state. Usually the, the yeah, that's... Okay, so as Mowgli um, adds there that, yes, you worth checking because usually those so-called local rentals can't leave the state. So it's a good point. Um, but uh, even so, if, if it is within state, even so, you may want to just go for the additional cost of paying all those extra miles or whatever to rent a truck that actually has a lift gate or at least get some kind of equipment to make it a lot easier on yourself. Um, basically, the first time I wasn't too sure what to expect, and I said I was kind of out of time when I realized this was going to be a snag and uh, kind of had to wing it and figure it out once I got there. So when we started actually trying to load stuff, it became very painfully obvious that it was not safe to do so and it just wasn't going to work. Uh, most of your one-way trucks, they at least have like a pull-out ramp, but trying to push 500, 2,000 pounds up a ramp, even with four or five people, is just not, it's just not going to happen. Um, so... <laughs> University of Alabama, so, that would not have worked. We did not have a place to put something like that yeah. down. Um, maybe yeah. in other locations it could work. Then you have to pack it for however they're going to handle that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a possibility sometimes you know, freighting things back rather than doing it on your own. It's all a matter of cost, time, effort, and what works in your particular situation. So um, anyway, uh, once it became obvious that the truck we had was not going to be loadable, um, we ended up going and getting a local rental that did have a lift gate and then kind of shuttling things into local storage units that I had got in advance, knowing that, hey, even if I do get this truck filled, if I try and pack everything in there, assuming it all fits, 
you'll probably be over the weight limit for the truck, which I'll get into in a minute. But um, so the uh, that that kind of led into the second trip, though, is once everything was in local storage down there. OK, go back home, figure out what I'm going to do, come up with a plan, go back and retrieve it. Um, and that was the second trip. So basically got some rented uh, lifting equipment. Um, and, and I'll get into that later. But uh, when choosing a truck, the next thing you'll kind of need to consider is the size of equipment that you are uh, trying to move. So if possible, ensure that the equipment not only fits upright in the truck, but can be tilted from laying down to upright if you need to. Um, and you also want to ensure that it'll make it through the door without issue as the doors are often six inches less than the interior height of the truck. If it's like a roll up or a sectional type, um, door versus like a semi trailer has doors that open and basically fold around the side of a truck, you wouldn't have that problem. Um, but your typical rental box truck will have a roll up type and the door is about six inches or so less than the interior height. Um, at least as a point of reference, uh, the 26 foot Penske box truck on the left in my top picture there, uh, has an interior height of about eight feet. Meanwhile, the smaller truck on the right was more like seven and a half feet, which meant the, uh, seven foot DMS frames did not fit in the back door upright. And once they were in on their side, there was not enough height to stand them up because of the diagonal of the seven foot frame was more than seven and a half feet. Um, which meant that they all had to get transported on their side, which reduced the capacity of the truck substantially and just meant more trips. Um, Another thing, as I mentioned earlier, you want to keep your gross vehicle weight rating in mind, um, as well as the limit of what you're allowed to legally drive. Most states, uh, normal driver's license are a class C, which means you have a 26,000 uh, pound or maybe 25,999 pound limit on what uh, kind of vehicle you can drive. Um, Illinois is a bit more limited. We have what's known as a class D license, which is a 16,000 pound limit. I think there's only one other state that does that. Um, but in the Illinois law, there is a, an exception for if you are driving a rental, uh, a rental vehicle for moving personal property, which technically this was, um, it'd be, it's a little weird for personal property, but it was. Um, they have an exception uh, up that you can drive up to 26,000 pounds. So I was covered there. Uh, beyond that, you need something that not necessarily a commercial driver's license since you're not doing it for hire, but you do need a higher weight class of license to get anything bigger than that. Um, aside from the licensing, you also want to make sure you have an idea of how much the truck is going to weigh um, by the time you actually have everything loaded in it. Um, if you're overweight on the road over the weight rating of the vehicle, obviously that comes with potential legal penalties. So, uh, something you can do is a number of truck stops have scales that are unofficial. They're not the way station on the side of the road type scales. You could take your truck there and weigh it and figure out if it's overweight. And then if it is, you figure out where, uh, what to do from there. Maybe you get rid of some things or deposit them in storage temporarily or whatever. So on the first part of the SL100 move, I drove down in my car, uh, loaded up with tools and other equipment. I picked up a couple people on the way and proceeded to Nashville where I picked up the fourth person from the airport. Then we went and got the truck uh, and then continued on to Tuscaloosa. So for the second part, I rented a car for a one-way trip to Nashville, dropped it off at the airport after we got the truck, um, decided not to try and bring the truck to the airport because that seemed like a bad idea. <laughs> and uh, one of the people that um, I was, that was helping uh, drove with me down there and uh, helped break up some of the driving. And uh, we decided uh, 
Well, I decided not to make that trip in one day again, just because of the way the scheduling worked out. So we stayed somewhere um, yeah, for a night and yeah. And uh, the five ESS move pretty much everyone kind of arranged their own travel. I drove because again, I loaded my car up with a bunch of tools and equipment that I thought we might need. And some people flew in, others drove. The truck to be used for the move was actually purchased, used, and driven to the site by one of the people who was helping. Um, so that's just kind of the point of reference for those there. So another piece of planning here, you'll obviously need a place to stay if you're kind of farther from where you live. Um, and uh, the details of booking a hotel aren't really the topic of this presentation, but there are a couple points worth mentioning. One is to make sure you have a place to park all of the vehicles that you're bringing, including the truck. And the other is that you should consider whether you're gonna cover lodging for yourself only or all of your helpers as well. Um, in both of the cases um, where I went, in both of the cases with the SL100 move, I basically offered to cover like all the lodging and, and food expenses of the people who came along. Um, and the only thing I kind of decided was out of my budget was like air travel. So, um, but beyond that, you know, restaurants and lodging were something I decided, hey, these people are helping me move this big heavy thing. I wanna make sure that this is as little of a burden on them as I can. Um, for um, storage, you should probably consider renting storage near the pickup location so that if you have too much stuff to bring back or you run into issues like I did, um, you've got somewhere to put the stuff until you can cut, uh, get back down there and find another plan. Um, you can always cancel it if you don't need it, but it's good to have it ahead of time and know that it's there if you do. Um, it is good to have ground floor storage in case you need it. Yes. Ground floor storage is preferable. Into that elevator. Um, yeah. Um, one point to keep in mind as well is that not every storage rental place is a 24 hour one, or not 24 hours so much, but even then, some don't have late hours. So there was. Um, the, on the first time I was down there, it turned out that one of the places, for some reason, they said their normal policy was to be open until like 11, but for whatever reason at this particular location, they normally closed up at like five or six, I think, and they kind of bent their rules and said, nah, it'll be fine. We'll just leave the stuff unlocked for you these couple of nights, and it worked out. But it was something to do with their security cameras or something. Yeah. Um, and another one you need to note is that uh, you're going to run into the same type of height issues that you do with a truck. Uh, typical storage units, in my experience, usually kind of have tall ceilings, but the doors into them are going to be like a six, uh, I'm sorry, like a seven foot door. Um, the, the same kind of yeah, so it's going to be, once again, you may have to turn things down on their side to get them in and then put them back upright once they're in storage, and you may have to come up with uh, creative solutions there to do that safely. And so, um, yeah, in uh, both parts of the SL100 move, we stayed at a hotel near the university campus. Uh, and actually stayed at the same place the second trip because it worked out fine the first time. So why change something that worked? Uh, for the storage of the equipment, I got uh, two 10 by 10 storage units near the university and also one closer to home, although I ended up not using the one closer to where I live because everything ended up in the garage that did come back. Um, in the second part of the move, we cleared out the two 10 by 10 units, uh, drove everything back to the Chicago area where I unloaded the truck into uh, some friends uh, <laughs> uh, warehouse. Uh, temporarily using their loading dock um, and then trailered all of it back to my home a few frames at a time. That's one towed behind my car. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, for the 5ESS move, I stayed in a hotel. Some other people split an Airbnb. One person brought a camper and stayed at a campground. The uh, truck itself was going to be used as temporary storage location since it was bought and owned um, until a more permanent site could be secured. So that kind of solved their storage problem in theory. Of course, that assumes the truck moves under its own power and does not dump lots of oil onto the exhaust, <laughs> which is why you should probably just rent or prepare to spend money on getting a decent truck. Um, depending on uh, how much disassembly and moving you need to do, you'll need a pretty wide variety of uh, tools and equipment. Uh, I highly recommend bringing some basic personal protective equipment. Think like work gloves, safety glasses, knee pads, bump cap or hard hat if you're going to be working near overhead objects. Uh, you're going to want water bottles if you're loading a truck uh, outside because it, it, yeah, it could be hot if you're in Alabama and you need to stay hydrated. You uh, need a lot of basic tools like screwdrivers, wrenches, socket wrenches, wire and cable cutters, an assortment of pliers, pry bars, utility knives or box cutters, hammers and saws. Um, I don't think I used the hammer too much, but it probably got taken out at least once. Yeah. Um, um, the electric screwdriver was super useful for the... Yeah, I'll get to that. Okay. Um, you want deep sockets for sure to go with your socket wrenches if any of the equipment is anchored to the floor. Usually those are floor studs with a nut on them, and if you don't have a deep socket, then you're going to have trouble getting on that nut. and You don't want to be there with a normal wrench in limited room. So... Uh, power tools like impact drivers, drills, or electric screwdrivers can make very quick work of removing fasteners. If you have them, bring them. If you don't, consider buying them or finding somebody you can borrow them from. Don't forget your extra batteries and chargers for power tools um, and extension cords and power strips if you have corded tools or laptops or whatever else that you may need to run. Don't rely on the infrastructure of the building you're going to be in. Um, yes, as Paul just noted, uh, radios could be useful too. We made great use of those at the university because the room that we were in, if you left, then you came back, you had to like call somebody to come let you in. And it was a lot easier to stop bothering the university people and just have two way radios on some sort of unlicensed band that, you know, you're legal to transmit on and just be hey, I'm at the door, I need to be let in, and then somebody comes out and lets you in without having to bother people who are still trying to get their normal work done while you're there. Recommendation also with the tools, make sure that they're tempered tools. If you need to use force, <laughs> hammer, um, you don't want cheap, cheap tools because it, they'll snap. Yes. Um, Digital multimeters are also useful if you need to trace out any wiring or check for live voltage. Um, you may need a ladder, but it's worth checking if they have one on site that you can borrow. I did end up buying a ladder, but when I, we got there, it turned out they had like seven ladders and we didn't need to bring one. <laughs> are you going to talk about the tool DMS ladder? Uh, I think there's... Is there a picture of that somewhere? No, actually there's not. They had one very specific wooden ladder that was exactly the right width and height to get between the back aisle of the frames where there was less space and get up to, you know, a working height to, at the top of the cabinets. Um, and it, it had these really cool casters, so if you weren't on yeah. it, you could just like slide it up and down the aisle. It was yeah, it was a, a rolling ladder. Tool and it was super useful. For all we know, it had a Nortel part number. Yeah, uh, let's see. So uh, if they don't have ladders and you're bringing one, keep in mind you might need more than just one ladder. I believe in the left picture there we are preparing to remove some very heavy thing from the top of a cabinet and we definitely needed two people to do that safely which is why we had two ladders so um probably want to bring a variety of tape 
If you need to document cabling, bring some good labels that you can pre-print or hand label. Um, speaking of hand labeling, you probably want pens, pencils, and markers. Uh, you want some kind of padlock for any trucks you're renting um, and storage units. You wouldn't want somebody to steal your SL100 or 5ESS in the middle of the night when you're not watching it. <laughs> or donate you another one, yes. <laughs> You'll also want uh, various moving equipment. So pictured, I have a seven foot pry lever in the middle picture there. Um, an appliance hand truck and uh, some cheap movers dollies as well as some custom made skates that bolt to the bottom of a 42 inch Nortel cabinet. So custom moving equipment uh, may be the only good way to move some of the more obtuse equipment like those cabinets that setup assembled together is shown on the right. So, um, should I bring the mic over there? Aha, Jim is prepared. So as uh, a quick point out, not since I'm standing, this is the 42-inch uh, Nortel cabinet, which describes the width, and it's six feet tall. And those skates, that's one of them over there. They bolt using the same holes that are used to uh, mount the cabinet to the floor. And um, the I built those, and the size of wheel on those is basically I found the highest capacity weight rating cheap eBay wheels I could. Um, looked at the height and determined that once it was on the skates, it would still fit through a seven foot door. And also when I put the pry lever under there, I could use it to get it up high enough to get the skates underneath. So um, this is the uh, pry lever, which was extremely vital in moving a lot of the heavier, larger cabinets. The general idea is you get it under something and then you have a huge mechanical advantage to lift. I think this is rated for 7,000 pounds. Um, and you can go all the way to the floor with it if you have the room for the lever, considering that this is an 84 inch length here. And that height is one of the things that designed the height of the skate. So that gets a cabinet up just enough to slip this under there. Um, and when I did that, it was usually a process of picking up the cabinet a couple two by four heights at a time so that uh, it wasn't at a weird angle, which would make it more likely to tip over. Uh, one thing you missed on tools, you might go into this more, but the two by having. I will get to that. All right. Okay. Um, so on the left here, we are preparing to use the appliance dolly for moving a frame. Uh, I'm inserting a board in there to provide some spacing and extra support since that cabinet didn't really uh, rest on the, um, the normal rubber pads on the edges there. Um, and then over on the right, you'll see that it also doubles as a recliner. Um, <laughs> You're going to want a lot of small lengths of lumber, like short pieces of 2x4 and 2x6 or the like. Uh, use them as shims underneath equipment to uh, keep it off the ground, uh, etc. You are going, you, you'll find ways to use them. Just make sure you bring plenty or plan to buy some and cut it to length as needed. Uh, in the middle is a pretty good demonstration of the use for the lumber and the Johnson bar or the pry lever. Here we're using the wood to keep one of the 42 inch cabinets level and off the ground while we're kind of slowly inching it off the lift gate and ultimately onto some mover dollies. Um, work lights or good flashlights may be needed depending on how blocked the lighting in the room is by overflowing cable racks. Um, in the case of the University of Alabama, when they put the switch in, I can't remember how good of a how, how uh, well they plan the lighting, but I seem to remember a lot of it being burned out a long time ago and very inaccessible, so they could not have possibly replaced the lights. That's why the DMS comes with its own lights. Um, Which 
some of them were also burned out. Yeah, well, none of those were connected by the time we got there, That's so yeah. all the power was undone. But uh, So uh, you also need packing and moving materials, so ESD bags for sensitive parts, uh, bubble wrap, lots of containers for screws and other small parts, probably good to plan one container for each cabinet. Uh, it's easier to keep stuff straight that way. Just get a bunch of small, like, Tupperware-type containers and throw all your bolts and screws and nuts in there and keep them with the cabinet. Um, padding, moving blankets for putting between things, cardboard, you know, kind of serve that purpose of the, filling the interstitial uh, space between things once you load them cable ties, boxes, uh, ratchet, yes, lots of ratchet straps. Um, make sure you have enough, depending on the weight of the things you're moving and how big they are. You can probably plan to have two ratchet straps per every two cabinets to kind of strap them together. Um, you will need somewhere to put cabling, like large boxes, bins, or maybe a big Gaylord pallet, just make sure you have a way to move it once it's full. Um, if you don't have a lift gate on your truck, this is an alternate option. You can rent a material lift like this from your usual uh, tool rental places. They're not ideal, but it beats pushing things up a ramp. Um, just make sure that your equipment doesn't weigh over the rating and or else you could have to uh, kind of strip everything out of it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so the one pictured there has a weight rating of 650 pounds. We had a little concern using it to pick up the big 42 inch cabinets. Uh, on the second trip when we were doing this, we did take the card shelves out of it to reduce the weight. And even then it was Still kind of a pain to get under there, but we made it work and got it up into the truck and had to do that one more time for the other big cabinet. Everything else kind of went down on its side, got laid on the, the lift and then up into the truck and slid off. Um, if you're more daring, you may try to rent a small forklift or a pallet stacker instead, but then you may have to contend with... Um, how to transport such a thing, which is substantially heavier than the things it's moving. Um, a lot more expensive to rent that. And also you could get in trouble with the property owner if they are not happy with you driving a forklift in the uh, storage unit parking lot. So uh, once the planning is all done, now you just need to execute it. Um, once you arrive, there's a few things you probably want to take care of before you get started. It is a good idea to make sure the power is off. In a telephone office, at least there can be several hundred amps of 48 volts DC or even more. The entire box under the wrench was just like evaporated into somebody's face. I did not see that when I was there. It, it was framed on the, huh. the workbench. I didn't, I didn't see that one. See That's, <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, I believe it, though. I've heard similar stories about evaporated wrenches. Um, so anyway, <laughs> in both cases, we, in both telephone switch uh, removals, we made sure that the power was disconnected long before we got there because that greatly reduces the risk of vapor depositing your favorite wrench onto your face. <laughs> Um, following that, you will want to track down any fragile pieces that you should remove before moving and pack separately, particularly hard drives. Um, make sure you document where all of those parts go so that they can be reinstalled in the correct places later. In the case of larger, older drive technologies, like a 14-inch platter drive or the like, you probably want to ensure the heads are parked and locked if there are external controls for that. Uh, oftentimes, there are instructions in the manuals for drives like that that kind of tell you shipping preparation, what orientation to put it in, how to lock uh, the heads and the platters. So um, if they don't specify shipping orientation, usually it's the same orientation as the allowed running orientations. But 
you know, it can vary. Um, obviously, you have to disconnect all of the cables. You don't need to remove cables that don't leave a cabinet or a frame, but anything that does will need to be disconnected, obviously, before you get them unbolted from each other. Um, if you need to document where cables go, you'll want to do that during this step as well. During the SL100 removal, I had pre-printed several hundred label pairs with numbers on them. Uh, the idea was to take one half of the pair and apply it uh, to the cable, and then the other half would be applied where the cable plugged in. Um, that way, the ends could be matched up with where they go later on. Once I actually got there, it became very obvious that uh, all of the cabling almost universally already had labels on it that detailed where they're uh, supposed to go. So ended up not having used most of those labels, but they still got used in a couple places. Uh, you can see in the picture on the right, we labeled uh, some hard drives in that fashion. So the hard drives have a label on them, and then the slot where they go has the uh, matching label. Once you have the cabling undone, then you have to figure out how everything is bolted together. And in the case of telephone switches, as I mentioned earlier, usually the adjacent equipment frames are bolted together, uh, and then they will also be bolted to the floor. Often there's also cable racking or trays overhead that may be attached to the frames and cabinets, and that may have to come down as well. Um, try to figure out the least amount of work that can be done just to get the equipment loose so you can move it. Uh, and get it into the truck. Try to figure out, um, sorry, not only will that save you time during the disassembly, but it'll save you time later when it goes back together too. And uh, don't forget to take pictures to document how everything was together so that you can reference it later. Uh, when it comes to moving, obviously start with the bigger pieces to load onto the truck and pack the smaller parts in around them. Um, if you're moving things to local intermediate storage for transport to its destination during a later trip, you may want to move that on a nightly basis just to get it out of your way and give yourself as much room to work as you can possibly get. In any case, just make sure that you're working efficiently and safely. Uh, big iron is not worth more than you or your helper's well-being, so just be safe. Don't we don't want anybody to get squished. Um, when we were removing the SL100, we started with the hard drives, of course, and also started working on removing cabling. By the end of the day, we had all the hard drives uh, packed up and all the cabling to the front row of equipment undone, which was around five cabinets. On the second day, we unbolted those and from the floor and from each other, and we had them moved out of the room to give us some more space to work. We also got uh, one other cabinet removed, another loose from the floor and its neighbor, started working on decabling some additional cabinets after that. We tried to load a couple of the lightest cabinets into the truck using the ramp. We did succeed, but it was uh, obvious uh, we'd have a hard time doing that with the other cabinets. So just getting cabinets out of the building was proving difficult since um, Every doorway required the cabinet to be tipped further than the appliance dolly normally did to make it through. We ended up getting some like flat furniture, movers, dollies uh, type of things instead, laid them down completely and then didn't have to deal with the height of the doorway after that. Um, that night though, we reserved a truck with a lift gate from Enterprise and we also bought some uh, Harbor, f those, those uh, Harbor Freight moving dollies. So the next day, oops, Sorry, the next day um, turned out that the truck we had rented had a check engine light. So we scrambled and found another place to rent a truck from uh, with a lift gate. And that truck was a little smaller and meant we had to tip the frames over to get them inside as I kind of went over earlier, but at least we had a way to move them. Uh, after returning with the new lift gate truck, we prepared to move one of the larger 42 inch frames. Uh, we picked it up with the lever dolly and uh, propped it up on pieces of wood until it was uh, high enough to slip the dollies underneath and got it out of the building. Had to spend some time getting it onto the lift gate and into the truck and then did the same with the other 42 inch cabinets and uh, got one of them unloaded that night but uh, and some of the other 
cabinets, but not all of them. And the fourth day, we got a few more frames unbolted. By the end of the night, we had seven in storage and two more light ones on the one-way truck back to Chicago. And then on the fifth and final day, we got four more unbolted. Those four and uh, two more that had been unbolted on previous days loaded into the the small truck and then started cleaning the switch room out of basically everything that wasn't bolted down. Um, there were a few cabinets and shelves filled with spare parts, documentation, tapes and CDs, other loose equipment, all manner of sheet metal parts we disassembled in the uh, prior days. Spent the rest of the night unloading the truck uh, into storage before we dropped that truck off and found a motel to spend the night at. Seems like I'm kind of short on time here. I'm going to try and speed up. Uh, the very first day of the 5e removal was before i arrived as i kind of described two people from our group started on tuesday to assess and start doing early prep um, second day more people arrived and we kept working on decabling it we had most of the cabling to the first row from the mdf removed a lot of progress made uh, on the on that day and then on the third day we had almost all the cabling done and the cable rack had been taken down that was overhead since it was basically empty. Still had some cabling between the rows to take care of. And then on the fourth day, we got all that done, unbolted all the frames, and they were ready to go. So uh, that was Saturday evening. We didn't do anything else on Sunday because we didn't really need to. And then on Monday, we did the last few tasks, and the movers arrived, loaded everything onto the, onto the truck. Um, so I've got some tips that might help you during your removal. If you familiarize yourself with the architecture of the system beforehand, you may be able to work more efficiently. For example, you can determine whether you actually need to document all the cabling uh, or if you can use the documentation uh, to figure it out later. So documenting the cabling takes a lot of time that you may not have. So it can be helpful to skip all or some of it. In the case of the SL100 and the 5 ESS, documentation does exist out there that goes over most of the cabling. On the 5 ESS, there is at least one place you're guaranteed to have a working terminal. On the SL100, it's not quite, so you should note where the terminals were so that you can get back into the system, and then the system will have all, internally all the configuration records will tell you where things are supposed to be hooked up. Um, in the case of the SL100, I actually found a book that detailed where everything was supposed to be plugged in, where all the cards were slotted, um, which meant that all the cable labeling was just redundant information. Um, another tip is, uh, like I said before, get yourself as much space to work as you possibly can uh, as early as possible, because that will allow you to work more efficiently. So if it can be cramped, get stuff out of your way and you'll have more space to work, you can work a little faster. Um, also, make sure you put ratchet straps on the equipment as it's loaded or else someone might have to crawl over everything to the front of the truck to put <laughs> straps on something you forgot. <laughs> Another thing I noticed is that it was pretty easy during both of these moves to kind of completely forget about lunch um, it might make it easier to find places to get food in advance or maybe just go grocery shopping and pick up like a bunch of snacks and then you won't have to kind of worry about lunch so much. Uh, somebody did that on the 5e move. They picked up a bunch of like snack foods and that was basically what we subsisted on until we went to dinner. And that worked out pretty well. Uh, and the last point is uh, that you should expect to run into expected issues. Once you arrive on site, one of the more obvious things now that I've done this a couple times is that you're very likely to discover that there is a lot more stuff that was not originally mentioned that you're going to end up taking. Uh, could be spare parts, documentation, uh, other random treasures that really have nothing to do with the thing you're taking. Um, yeah, it's uh, oftentimes you being there removing things gets used as an excuse to make a massive reduction in the amount of disused junks, junk that's been accumulating over the decades. So you may also run into a situation where you need a tool that you didn't bring with you, uh, know in advance where you can go to buy or rent tools locally. So these are some credits for the photos in my presentation and some links. Eventually this will be posted online and uh, I think I'm out of time to answer questions, but maybe I'll move into the hallway 
after I clear my props out here and I can answer any questions. Maybe but it's maybe you mentioned it, I missed it, but where did the five VSS end up? Uh, it's headed to Florida eventually, but the truck needs some work before somebody's willing to drive it. Um, so I think it's in Ohio right now. Um, that's kind of an interesting one. From what I hear, the guy is actually... Um, so he's part of a voice over IP carrier and... As it's kind of a weird situation. He's going to try and co-locate it in an AT&T CO, <laughs> which would not be my choice. But, you know, if, if he gets it done, more power to him. Um, but, yeah, I think it's uh, – is there a presentation at 12, Jim? No. Okay. You have time. Okay. All right. Well, then I'll sit up there. Are there any other questions? Yes. Great presentation. I have no plans on doing this, but great presentation. <laughs> so my question is, uh, and this is not if anybody here is in a union, and this is not a disparaging comment on unions, but I had a job, an old job, where we had a, I was not a union member, we were pulling coax, and we ran afoul of some of that. Did you run into any issues with union shop, closed shop, what are you doing kind of thing? Not in either of these cases, no, but actually that's probably a good point. Yeah, um, into this, speaking from experience, check in with somebody just so you're all in codes. Yeah, yeah, so if, if that's a good point. Um, I don't know how well the room mics pick up your question there, but I'll, so I'll repeat it. But yeah, the statement was that uh, you may need to uh, check to make sure that you don't run afoul of any uh, like union uh, agreements um, when you're doing this sort of thing. So, thank you, Joe. Uh, would you do it all over again? <laughs> <laughs> you saw the third slide. <laughs> yeah, I probably would. <laughs> I'd, I'd probably do things differently, but yes. Um, one, tool, one tool thing that I just want to say is the, the moving dolly with the wheels that fold out mm -hmm. was absolutely essential. Um, you need to have the wheels that fold out because a lot of them don't. And trying to get it yeah. through that tipping everything. They kind of have, so. yeah, sort of two weight classes of those appliance movers dollies. Or, or hand trucks, they have like 600-ish pound ones, which are just the two wheels, and then they have 1,200-ish pound ones that have the second set of wheels that fold out and kind of tip the thing at a 45-degree angle so you don't have to support it. Um, I opted for the larger one. I got most of the moving equipment I needed used or built it myself. That was locally sourced around here where I live and uh, cost me not very much compared to a new one and the uh, appliance moving hand truck I got locally as well. Um, so if you have a little time to source that kind of stuff, you can get it on the used market if you're kind of in an area where that's uh, you've got a good availability of that sort of thing. Um, I would also like to save some money. That Joe somehow managed to fit both of those things, that giant moving dolly and yes. the Johnson bar in the crown bit. And four people. So the Crown, yeah, and I should detail a little further, the seats in the back of the Crown Vic do not fold down. Um, I basically, there may even be a picture here. Let's see. There was a picture of the Crown. It may not be so visible, but... Uh, yes, let me try that again. This one, yeah, so you can kind of see it there in the bottom. The appliance dolly is sandwiched between the two front seats, extending all the way from the front of the car to the back. You have to like, pull the radio out or something, right? 
the radio did not need to be pulled out, but it was butted against. So I have the car had a dual DIN radio originally, which was purely AM FM, and I replaced it with a single DIN. And then there's just a piece of sheet metal above it to pat, to fill the hole. <laughs> um, I had to put a rag there to keep from scratching the paint on that sheet metal because it just barely fit in there. Um, and to get it in, I think I had to put one seat all the way back and the other one all the way forward and kind of like go in at an angle and swing it into place. Yeah, that, that was quite an adventure. The, uh, the lever dolly was taken apart and the wooden piece was put alongside the right side of the passenger seat in the front, extending from within the footwell to the back. Yeah, so um, I wanted to get out, I had to actually like lift the bar <laughs> over my head and like kind of duck under it, duck out. Yeah. And... The trunk was completely <laughs> full. I don't know if you've ever seen a Crown Vic trunk, but that is... That is it is very trunk. deep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and then we had, for a very short period, four people in the car um, until we got to uh, the, the truck rental place and then shifted a lot of the larger items into the truck. Yes. Looks like you learned a lot from the first one to do the second one. Now yes. Now the second one, I've learned about that. Thinking about the first move, if you had to do that one again, what would you do differently? Well, first of all, uh, there would have been a solution from the get-go for putting things in the truck, either without a lift gate or making sure I somehow had one with a lift gate. Um, probably would have seen if I could have gotten more people to help. Um, although it's always hard on short notice and um, gotten, um, yeah, and, and seen if I could have gotten a little more time. And also, again, time availability, but if I could have known, well, one, I would have known well in advance that I was not going to get the whole thing out and then I could have better prioritized what I wanted to get out and what I needed to get out. I did get a minimal system. It does boot and run and will do the basics, but there are some things that I could have prioritized even if it was grabbing some cards out of shelves because they did scan a document uh, that was in the auction that had basically a, the entire hardware build out of the switch, every card, every cable, well, the one they scanned just had every card anyway, but you could, I could have gone through the list and said, I want all of these, I want some of these, I want, and we could have pulled them out of the other frames and, and packed them into either the frames that were going, which would have made them heavier, or separately into boxes or whatever else. Would a separate like trip down there ahead of time to like see everything? Yeah. I mean, that's what they did on the, the 5E, right? There were yeah. a couple people who showed yeah, up. Yeah, there was actually the survey. The survey. somebody did go out there uh, well in advance just to look at it and take a quick video of, like, here's what we're dealing with. Yeah. And another thing, now that I think about it, is I would not have made any attempt to bring anything home on the first time if I had known. It just would have gone straight into local storage, and then I would have had a plan to, to, to just kind of split up and th with people's availability and whatever else, yeah. You would have got multiple ground floor storage units. It was hard. I, I was thinking about that, and there just w wasn't the availability. Oh, okay. That was the issue, yeah. yeah. Um, in the blue, back here. Yes. I've placed phone calls through it. Actually, there's a video on YouTube of the first phone call I placed through it. Um, so, as well as on my website, the same video. What was that? How much power does it draw? Yeah, so <laughs> I think I don't, I don't have the most recent numbers because it's kind of got to be split on two circuits and I only have so many kilowatt hours to measure my uh, power consumption, but as far as the uh, 120 volt side, I'm pushing 2,500, three kilowatts uh, kind of range. It can be stripped down a little further, but that's already running a lot of things that were originally duplex in simplex mode. Um, so, yeah. No, Mowgli. No, no. So, uh, the one thing, as you were talking about timing, that you also need to know is that 
these days, uh, during the Christmas season, most of the rental truck fleets are Amazon's bitches. And you'll have yeah. to rent their entire rental fleet to Amazon and everybody else. So roughly from October through, well, basically Christmas, end of December, if you try and get anything that's not a U-Haul truck, chances are pretty good you will be going like to another city to get it if you can find one at all. Um, that happens in most major metropolises and everything with the lift gate that we refer to as the local delivery vehicles, those almost always get rented out by the month at least, usually by the season, for all the people who do deliveries. So I've run into that <coughs> where when you buy something can also be kind of dangerous. If you're buying it anywhere past September, you need to check ahead of time that you actually can get rental trucks anywhere near where you need to get them. Yep, so availability of trucks in the holiday season is low. Keep that in mind. Uh, in the back. Hi, I have uh, three quick questions. Uh, first of all, how many frames were in the 5 ESS? That was 17. And uh, how did you fish the cables out of the cable trough? Because there's tons of cables. Um, basically, uh, we actually had somebody there who worked on the uh, 5 ESS as a CO tech um, in their uh, in their they're, uh, they were retired, but in their career, they were a CO tech. So um, their recommendation was, hey, kind of start with this one and because that appears to be the newest and start with that one because the cables are probably on top. Um, and that worked out pretty well. Uh, in the case of the SL100, we cut a lot of stuff and I'm slowly putting it back together in my garage. Yeah, but... Go ahead. How did you label each of the cables? I mean, you just said mentioned something about labeling, but how did you label each of the cables? So on the SL100, uh, a lot of the cabling was like D-sub type connectors. So you unscrew it and take the connector off. And then I blocked the mic there, but you put a label on the connector, just a stick on label with a number. And then where it plugs in, I put another label with the same number on it um, to tell you where to plug it back in. And that saves you from having to do all the detailed mess of like card three, port one, frame A, zero, two. But Nortel, when they installed the switch or the switch installers anyway, uh, or maybe Nortel shipped it to them that way, I'm, I think probably, but they ha actually had labels with that level of detail. Uh, that said, originating end, terminating end, frame number, shelf number, card number, port number, um, and cable length and some other details. Um, yeah, if if it's not going to be obvious what it was, like if it's just line card cables, cut it and deal with it later. If it's something else you that you're not familiar with, then. Yeah, label both. If you got to cut it, label the cut ends. For some of the line cards, trying to get those out, like the line shelves, we were up on the ladders and we were just, we just had diagonal cutters. Yeah, and we were yeah. just no going way. at it. It's yeah, I would. Campus switches that I normally would have to deal with. You end up having your truck come down with a whole mess of cabling. Yep. And you got the actual breakout panels elsewhere. And all you, the, the hard part there. Just keeping that straight is just yeah. right. Yeah, I mean there were there was a mass of cables like this big around. Yep, I got a photo of my my uh, one of my other helpers on um, uh, the, for that just holding up this mass. You can't see him. You just this bottom of the cable in front of him. <laughs> see if there's a picture of the cable racking, but I don't think so. Um, as far as cutting cables go, if you know you're going to be doing a lot, get yourself a good set of shears. They work a lot easier. We had a good set of those on the 5 ESS removal, and it made cutting through multi-pair cables a lot easier. Won't work necessarily on big, thick power cables unless you have, like, a hydraulic assist one or something, but the, uh, you know, plastic-insulated uh, twisted pair stuff, it'll go right through it very easily. Over there in the stripes. Did you, uh, when you were removing, I, the total removal on the cables, or... 
you have to be careful not to cut stuff that's going to take time. Um, in the case of the SL100, um, a lot of the cables that we were working around were known to be inactive. They did have some stuff on the main distribution frame that they had marked and said these are active circuits. But where we were cutting cables, it was pretty obviously things terminating into the switch itself. Um, didn't really have concerns about that. On the 5ESS, this was a working phone company uh, who had gotten rid of most of their copper circuits, but still had some remainder of them that were basically hung off a media gateway in the uh, CO. They'd switched off the 5E to a packet switch. Um, so there were still some active circuits, and it was very much like the recommendation from the most experienced person there, which made very much sense to me, and I kind of was the plan uh, from the beginning in my mind was, he said, if before you cut a cable, you better have one end in this hand and the other end in the other hand, before you cut that cable, you better be sure that you know where it's going and that it's not the important one. And the other thing was, do not cut any cables um, past 4 p.m. because the working day ends at 5 p.m. And if something needs to be spliced back together because you cut the wrong thing, don't make them work overtime. Yeah. I think the only things running in the DMS 100 were like emergency 911 and like a couple other circuits. Yeah, I think they had some T1s strung around campus still or something. Yeah, but they were connected to the outside plant cable, so they were they were terminating on the MDF. Any other questions? Back there. Um so depends what I'm working on. If it's cabling, usually I can figure out how to piece it back together refer to the documentation I have for where things were connected and then work on the cabling. And But certain other things, especially the configuration side, there's going to be a learning curve there. I've got a lot of configuration I need to clear out first for things that no longer exist. Uh, and as I found out recently, the order for doing that is important because if you have X, which refers to Y, which refers to Z, you can't delete Z first. You have to delete X, then Y, then Z. Um, and in certain cases, the methods of deleting X, Y, and Z may be substantially different between them, depending on what it is. Um, I ran into a couple of cases where one time the DMS told me you should not be working directly in this table, and it didn't tell me that until after I started up the expect script that deleted the things. Um, and I got some sort of circular loop where the thing depended on itself and could not be deleted because it depended on itself, and you can't delete the thing it depended on, which was itself. <laughs> and I, I could not do that either. So I just turned it off at, without saving and turned it back on. Um, and the second time, I'm pretty sure I ran into a bug, which is that if you deleted something in a certain type of table, um, the deletion logic worked a little weird and it i it was like a subtable of a table and i deleted the thing that owned the subtable and the subtable should have cycled through every entry and deleted themselves which it did except when you delete items in that particular subtable it would split off the part you actually deleted and leave the part you didn't because it was kind of a range and i think the dms did it wrong on its own and it went through and deleted it as if it was the normal way so it tried to delete everything but it deleted it and which caused it to split the thing and be on the next entry afterward and it ended up with oops it ended up with a lost chunk of stuff somewhere which still existed enough to be dependent on another thing I needed to delete, but could no longer be deleted because the handle was gone. So again, turn it off, turn it back on, don't save. <laughs> and, and then you start thinking, maybe I should come up with 
a more detailed plan before I attempt this again um, and do things in a very particular order in a very meticulous manner, which is kind of where I'm at now. There, um, there are also a bunch of like trainings for the DMS 100 that you have, right? Yeah, I have uh, a lot of paper manuals that, as far as I'm aware, do not exist in digital form. Um, some of them are bound books that I would like to not cut the spines off of. So I'm going to see what's out there in terms of book scanners and, and what I can do there. And others are binders and I'll just run them through the sheet feed ADF and be done with them when I get the time. But there are some interesting uh, training materials on configuring the switch and as well as some basics of telephony. Like I read a pretty good uh, book titled, I think it was... Uh, I just want to say it was tr a theory of transmission or transmission or something. And it's all about like trunk carrier outside plant type stuff and loss and, and uh, signaling and things like that, which was kind of a cool read. Any other questions? Okay. If, uh, not. Oh, there again. <clears throat> Um, it'd be, so there are some, uh, certain types of, I'd make sure I had a variety of analog trunk cards to play around with. And then there are some other common equipment type cards for, um, like six port conference cards, which can be strung together to make a larger conference and things like that. Um, let me think there are. I would have maybe, well, I don't know if I would have had the documentation to do so, but there are multiple types of line cards and they support different things. So the standard line card supports your basic residential or business type analog phone line. And then there are other cards that support uh, key telephones that I have uh, plenty of. And then there are line cards that support um, pay phones as well as uh, party line ringing which would have been nice to get more of. I think I have one or maybe two, and none of this stuff is unobtainable online. You're just going to pay for it because these are still around in quantity and active production for the moment, and they're not pennies on the dollar just yet. Um, so, yeah. Yes. So the SL100 was installed in 1984 uh, and was upgraded through the years and was still running until 2019 when they shut it off. Uh, I think the last upgrade they did was in 2009. The 5 ESS was running until a few years ago when they had a storm in the area and it took out some equipment and they were having trouble. They were already in the process of migrating to their uh, newer packet switch at the time and when they took the hardware out, they were having trouble getting it back up completely. And in the whole time they were, they had uh, an outage of basically the whole switch. So in as much time as it would have taken them to restore service on the five ESS, uh, they basically determined they could migrate the remaining lines off the five E to the, their newer switch. Um, and just it was already in plans to be shut down it just accelerated their schedule and that one was installed i'm not sure exactly i don't remember if, i think maybe 1994 but the 5 ess uh, was uh, the design is from 1982 and again had been upgraded through the years to improve uh, the design efficiency of space and uh, energy and things like that i believe the dms they had like one of the original cabinets, the JNAT, right? Yeah, some of the, the older cabinets were still there, just abandoned in place because when it's in the middle of the aisle, you can't really get it out. Um, so usually if they decommission something, they just kind of leave it there um, and maybe they'll reuse the space if they absolutely need it. But, so you know. The ESS might still be commercially viable if this guy wants to use it? Uh, I mean depends how much work you're willing to put into it and 
I mean, in terms of like power consumption, I'm not sure what he, exactly he's going to plan to do with it, but commercially viable is probably not exactly the goal. Um, yeah. But there's still a lot of 5 ESSs, DNS 100s, and uh, production environments in you know various uh, local exchange carrier COs around the country. Uh, I checked Lurg recently because somebody had asked about DMS 100s, like how many are still in service. Lurg, I forget what it stands for. It's an acronym, L-E-R-G, but it's um, basically a list of every phone switch in the U.S. Um, and you can do a query by switch type, and the number that came out for DMS 100s was still like well over a thousand. Uh, and five ESSs, I would imagine, are still all over the place in AT&T COs across the U.S. And that's not counting internationally. Any others? Okay.